Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're picking up in Zechariah chapter 3, and the exiles have returned to Jerusalem, if you remember, to rebuild the temple, but they had lost their gumption for nearly two decades, and the building project hadn't been started. So Zechariah is prodding and encouraging them to get started at the beginning and to continue throughout the book on rebuilding the temple. Now, the temple was the place where God visited his people in the Old Testament. Imagine if you were going to have a guest come over and stay at your house, but you didn't really do anything to prepare a room for them or a bed for them to sleep in, and you didn't make any sort of changes before they arrived. Well, if you didn't have room, a bed cleared off, the guest might not end up staying there that night. And what's more, they might not be very inclined to come back to your house to stay again. Well, the temple was not ready, and that was like the guest house for Yahweh not being ready yet. Was also, the temple is also important because at the temple, Israel offered Yahweh all kinds of sacrifices. Now, I'm, I know that you share meals with people who you love, who are important to you. Well, the ancients thought of sacrifice really in many ways as simply a shared meal uh, with deities. And for Israel, they thought of sacrifices as a shared meal with Yahweh and with the priests. Other sacrifices were basically thank you cards to God, and others were literally peace offerings or offerings for guilt or sin. The sacrifices were the concrete way that the people and Yahweh maintained a close relationship and shared things, just like we still share things with people we love. Of course, you can't have a meal without a cook or someone preparing that food. I mean, even if the cook is Chef Boyardee or uh, your friend wearing big red shoes, Somebody has prepared that meal, even if you didn't see them do it. So too with the temple and sacrifices. You could have a temple, and someone could even bring a sacrifice, but you need priests to prepare and properly make the sacrifices. Which brings us to our reading for today. In chapter 3, Zechariah has a vision that addresses a real concern or, or quandary uh, that for the returning exiles, and it's this. They're in the midst of rebuilding a temple, but a big question still remains separate from that. Will they even be able to properly use or utilize the temple when it is rebuilt? Who would be able to prepare and present the sacrifices? Because in books like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, before the destruction of the temple, Yahweh made no bones about the sacrificial system. It was broken, and it disgusted him at that point. He declares that basically he no longer accepted their sacrifices. He had, in essence, rejected the temple and priests alike, as well as their sacrifices. So, now, would he even accept the sacrifices that they brought? Since the last thing he'd said was, I don't want your stinking sacrifices. Well, the Jews had a high priest picked out already named Joshua, even though they had concerns and questions. And Joshua's grandfather had been a priest prior to the Babylonian inv invasion. However, remember, again, Yahweh had rejected and burned up the first temple. Would Joshua fare any better? Would he be accepted or rejected and burned up like that old temple guard had been? Now, this wasn't just Joshua's problem. It was a problem for all the returning exiles in Jerusalem. Would Yahweh recognize them and their sacrifices? This new temple, it's clear, was clearly not nearly as impressive as the first one. If Solomon's marvelous wonder of the ancient world had failed, right, well, what hope would a second-rate temple and a cheap rip-off version of the original temple, what, what chance would it stand? What right did Joshua or the returning exiles in Jerusalem have to stand in Yahweh's presence? Well, absolutely none, which is exactly what the prosecution was saying. In Zechariah's vision, Satan, whose name basically means prosecutor, was throwing the book at Joshua. 
The sins of the Jews, the past failures, their uninspiring second temple, all testified as, and were evidence against the worth of Joshua, Jerusalem, and the Jews. Satan might have said something like, look at him. What's he doing standing in your presence with us magnificent and awesome angelic beings? Need I remind you, God, that not just anyone is allowed to stand in your holy presence without being judged. No mere mortal can stand before you. A special dispensation must be made for folks like Moses or Elijah. And <laughs> don't even tell me you're going to make an exception for this riffraff. They're like the puniest, most hard-hearted, most miserable and pathetic people on the face of the earth right now. It would be beneath you to hold an audience with them or with him. He's done nothing to deserve being here. Satan, who at this point is allowed to stand before Yahweh, wasn't wrong, really. But instead of listening to Satan, the Lord instead rebuked Satan, saying, Have I not saved Joshua? Have I not plucked this man like a burning brand from the midst of the burning city of Jerusalem for this very purpose? You know, what's this burning brand? It, like, if you take a burning brand out of the fire, you've saved it. And Yahweh says, I've saved him. Joshua would not, could not be standing here if I had not brought him, if I had not taken him out of the fire. And that's why these people are still around. There is no other explanation, no other possible way they would even exist if not for my protection. You said it yourself, Satan. They could not be relied to do this on their own. No, it is I who have miraculously rescued them from Babylon and brought them back to Jerusalem. It is I who have saved them from their enemies, who tried to wreck their plans. It is I who have commissioned them to rebuild the temple. In other words, my decision has already been made because Joshua is here, and only I could have brought him here. I, the Lord, have brought Joshua to restore my people so that I can accept the offerings he brings to me and extend the olive branch to my people. Well, Joshua's Filthy robes in this vision represent the sins of the people, their poverty, and probably their unimpressive temple and their haltering and failing and, and imperfect efforts to rebuild the temple. But the Lord who sees them nevertheless replaces them. The Lord now replaces Joshua's filthy robes with a new robe from the Lord. Again, not because of anything Joshua's done, but simply, or the people, but simply because the Lord has mercy. To Joshua, the Lord says, See, I have taken away your iniquity. I will clothe you with proper, freshly pressed, probably appropriate priestly vestments. And then the Lord of hosts instructs Yahweh, Walk humbly, follow the Lord. If you do this, God will strengthen you to lead the people and continue to present offerings before me. But now, now everyone listen to me. I mean, literally, this is what the text says. Everyone listen. Joshua, in case you don't get it, Joshua the high priest is a sign for the future. In case there's any confusion, I just want everyone to take note. God says, this is a sign about the future. I will bring my servant the branch from Jesse's stem. See, I have set a foundational stone before Joshua for the building of this temple. I will speak through this stone, and I will remove all the sin of the land in a single day. Though this man is imperfect, and my people are dirty, and their temple is frankly unimpressive, I nevertheless will cleanse you, the whole lot of you, from all your sin in a single day. In other words, the message to the people who are wondering, will God accept us? Will he accept our sacrifices? The answer is, don't give up. You're still my people, and yes, I am still with you. We see Jesus likewise on trial, although some of the details are remarkably different. He is accused, but this time it is God who is accused by the world, particularly by God's people. And Jesus is likewise attacked by God's enemies and by Satan. We're told Satan insidiously uses Judas to betray Jesus. The supposed high priests of Jerusalem offer Jesus up as a sacrifice. He's attacked by the crowds who accuse 
and mock him, and the Romans nail him to a cross and crucify him. It looks certainly as if Jesus has lost all hope, as if he has not a leg to stand upon. There is no way in which a crucified man should be alive. Outside of God's intervention, there is no way he could be alive. And yet, on Easter, we see Jesus lives. In the resurrection, the Father has said, there is no way Jesus could be standing here before me, alive and resurrected, if I had not done it. Zechariah chapter 3 specifically says that the high priest was assigned. Joshua, remember, was to help rebuild the temple and so reconcile God's people to him. This very Sunday, we're going to see in our reading that Jesus will claim that he is the rebuilt temple. Destroy this temple, he says, and I will basically rebuild it or raise it up on the last or in three days. At Calvary, Jesus offered a sacrifice to reconcile God to the whole world. And Jesus will prophesy elsewhere concerning himself that he is the cornerstone of the house of God, the stone upon which Yahweh said he would write an inscription and remove the sin of the land in a single day. In Jesus, we have an atoning sacrifice, a sacrifice so pure that no other one is needed. Joshua, if you remember, needed God to put a righteous robe upon him. But Jesus stands innocent before God, and it is he who comes to place his righteous robe upon us. Luke 23 is proof that Jesus can and does do exactly that. One of the criminals on the cross begs of Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This criminal, like you and me, had no leg to stand on before God. Clearly in the wrong and punished justly, yet Jesus has mercy and says, I stand before God and you too shall stand before God. Jesus not only stands and lives today before the throne of Yahweh, but he continues to bring criminals and sinners like you and me to stand beside him in paradise. And so remember that no matter who, including Satan, no matter what attacks you, you stand righteous and reconciled before God because Jesus stands with you and for you. In Jesus' name, amen.